So I am Desiree Garcia. I'm the Associate Professor of Director of Film and Media Studies. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest this evening, Michael Phillips, the film critic for the Chicago Tribune. In addition to writing film criticism in Chicago, Michael is a recurring guest host on the cable television channel, Turner Classic Movies. Perhaps some of you have seen him uh, functioning in that capacity. He has also written broadly on the arts and culture for such newspapers as the LA Times, the San Diego Union Tribune, the St. Paul Pioneer Press, the Dallas Times Herald, and the Twin Cities City Pages, the paper where he got his start. He's been influential as a jurist for the Pulitzer Prize, and he advises the Roger Ebert Fellowship in Media Criticism at the University of Illinois. And this year, Michael was also awarded the prestigious Roger Ebert Award. Uh, given by the African American Film Critics Association, an award that, in the words of the association's president, quote, recognizes critics who follow in the tradition of Roger, who felt film was a vehicle that brings members of society together, and we look for people whose work reflects those sentiments. Michael has demonstrated his ability to recognize the world in his writing, end quote. Here to talk to us about the state of moviegoing in the 21st century, please join me in welcoming Michael Phillips. How's the sound? Sound okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, there was a that was a great seafood buffet with that award from the African Americans. <laughs> it, was, it was at the uh, uh, Marina Del Rey Country Club uh, or the Yacht Club. It was fantastic. So it was worth it was worth going to LA for that. Um, uh, thank you for coming on such a nice day. And uh, I'll tell you, from Chicago to here, uh, nice to be here today. <laughs> really nice. Um, I'm going to talk about. Uh, that's, that, that scares the hell out of me, i got to tell you. When he say, he's going to explain movies in the 21st <laughs> century. Always a bit frightening topic because it seems so large. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know, looking at you, and I, can, I know everything about you, just looking at you, uh, that, that roughly half of you are, um, I can tell your movie-going habits have changed in the last year or two. It's just, it's just the technology is such that I think... Am I right? Does anybody, does anybody feel like they're movie going ahead? Like, am I going out as much as I used to? Am I, am I staying in more? Things like that, right? It's, it's shifting. Yes, not, not, not. Good. Um, but I'm, I want to talk a little bit about that. And I want to talk about movies and where they're going and why I think they're going to stick around a little longer than a lot of the skeptics believe them. Uh, and I'm talking about exhibition, going out to see a movie this big rather than this big in your living room. Um, and I think they're going to stick around despite every form of distraction and competition that we're living with today. The short form distractions in our lives right now, you, you know, you name it, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, texting, emoji, <coughs> long form, well, we're right now we're all binge watching the same bizarre four year reality episode together, okay? The Trump administration, we're watching this show together. And we're gonna see if that is gonna be followed by another four year episode. In fact, I think we're gonna be able to vote on that. That's all I'm gonna say about that, okay? But I will say thank you to Donald J. Trump for revitalizing the concept of narrative suspense, okay? Because honestly, who knows what he's gonna say or do next. And I think Tuesday night's speech was, who saw it? You know, content aside, just in terms of tone, it was the least belligerent, least bullying, least divisive, most semi-quasi sort of presidential address he's ever given. And somehow, for me, that only amps up the suspense about what the damn guy's gonna say or do next, right? So, you know, is, is this a joke or trick? What is he setting us up for? I don't know, but there's something about life under under this new administration since, since November that has sort of fritzed all our attention spans a little bit, right? Am I the only one who thinks this? Okay, good, 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 good. I like that. Um, so, I think there's no stability. We feel a little unstable in a lot of aspects of our lives, not just our movie going lives, our lives right now. We can't even settle into a you know, a boring old award show with any confidence anymore and expect things to go smoothly. I mean, who saw the Oscars the other night? 
Uh, you know, La La Land, Best Picture. No, no, wait, whoopsie doozy, uh, wrong envelope, sorry, sorry, Moonlight, which I loved. I loved actually both of those movies. I loved La La Land and I loved Moonlight. And despite some of my problems with some of its problems, you know, La La Land, it would not have made me unhappy to see that actually win for more than a minute and 40 seconds. Um, <laughs> Although, if I hear City of Stars one more time, I think to paraphrase that Paul Thomas and Anderson movie, There May Be Blood. I think I've had it with that song. I've had it. Um, and I'd like to share, for you, share with you a few ideas about what I would call our addiction to visual and cinematic storytelling, because it's kind of related to a lot of other mm, technical digital addictions we're kind of dealing with right now. And it's, it really it covers however we consume these things we call moving pictures, okay? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I watch them and what got me hooked as a kid. And then I'm going to show you two scenes from two different action movies made almost 50 years apart, 48 years apart. A little compare and contrast exercise I'm going to call fast and slow, okay? And then I really do want to hear from you up here, um, you know, about how your movie going habits have changed. Um, whether it's for technological reasons or just life, okay? So, here is a key date in the annals of early movie going. April 21st, 1895. It's a year before my grandpa Larry was born. <laughs> On that date, that was the first projected movie shown publicly in America, New York City. It was presented by the Latham Brothers on a piece of equipment called the Panopticon. Reporter for the Sun, New, the New York Sun newspaper was there, and according to the correspondent, the film quote portrayed the antics of some boys at play in a park. They wrestled, jumped, fought, and tumbled over one another. Near where the boys were romping, a man sat reading a newspaper and smoking a pipe. Even the puffs of smoke could be plainly seen. Imagine that, and notice how right from the beginning. Decent roles for women were not to be found. Okay. <laughs> now, this was already a year after W.K.L. Dixon, an employee of Thomas Edison's, made a film called, and you can see this on online right now, uh, Record of the Sneeze. It's also known as Fred Ott's Sneeze. It's five <laughs> seconds long, this film. And it's meant to advertise the new medium of moving pictures, okay? It was the Vine video of the day, one second shorter than Vine. And now Vine has gone the way of Fred Ott's Sneeze, right? We've already, we've already lived long enough to see Vine come and go. Okay? Now, like still photography, movies seemed terrifyingly lifelike to many, even if the business of movies was, you know, conceived in sin, pure carnal commerce in action, right? In the heyday of the Nickelodeons, does I, who knows that phrase, Nickelodeons? Have you heard this? <coughs> Nickelodeons, heyday was 1905 to 1915, and through these early movie-going sort of experiences, very much one nickel was the, the cost of admission, lower and middle-class voyeurs became our first generation of moviegoers. And sometimes they were watching images on a communal screen, maybe that big, on a sheath or something in a, in a common room, or uh, more commonly, or just as common in a way, the viewer was truly alone with the image peering into a kinetoscope, a peephole, right? Like almost, what would you call it, binoculars? Or, you know, like right down there. Very private sort of relationship between you, your eyes, and the image. Um, and this is, you might be surrounded by other people doing it, but that's kind of where we are now in a funny way, more than a century later, we're together alone, right? <laughs> you know, that's, it's, it's the same idea. In the old days, this was the Nickelodeons were usually in a storefront, sometimes in a rough part of town. The money rolls in, movies <coughs> already started telling stories. But the story didn't really matter so much at first. Uh, the great train robbery came along in 1903, and that, that did tell a story. That was slightly longer than a lot of the other films of the day. And the money shot in that picture is the, the, the gunman shoots his pistol. Who has seen this? who is shoots his pistol right directly at the camera, and it was so sensational that it did not matter if that shot was inserted at the beginning or at the end of the film. I mean, people was up to the exhibitor. It didn't matter. It's, it's a great opening, and it's a great close, too, you know? And, and it was startled to people, and, and it scared the hell out of audiences in a way that was very, very good for business, okay? Um, 
And so the relation, thus the relationship between cinema and gun violence begins. <laughs> Here we are now. Then the movies get longer and the movies, you know, moved slowly into <coughs> newly built palaces full of all this grandiose oriental or Italianate exotic architecture. And there's still a few of these theaters around us. And we saw a very nice 1940 example today down on uh, the name again? On Mill Valley Art. Yeah, Valley Art. Okay, lovely. And uh, they've done a good job on the restoration. Um, and a lot of these old movie theaters were originally built as vaudeville houses. But some were created just to accommodate this fabulous new kinetic medium. Sound, I'm, just, I'm just skipping blithely through history here, okay? Sound comes along in the late 1920s. Many think it's going to ruin the poetry of the moving image. A lot of people wrote this. It is, sound will kill the movies, okay? <clears throat> Maybe a poetic dimension was lost. Um, when the art, and this is not in the notes, when the artist won the Oscar five years ago, we saw the artist here. I was surprised to, to run into some people, a lot of people I knew, so they were like, yeah, I hear it's okay, I'm not gonna go. Why, because it's a silent picture. And these are college educated, you know, they just didn't have the, that was somehow beyond their line. <laughs> I'm not gonna go to a silent, you know, funny. You know, it's just, what can you do? Um, but that, that's um, you know that's 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 kind of what you have to, you have to fight up against sometimes. Um, I think uh, uh, sound may have taken away a poetic dimension, but um, of course we don't question it now. After World War II, movie attendance takes a nosedive. There's this thing called television. It seems like a better, easier deal sitting there with the rabbit ears in the living room and a few televisions in the late in the late 40s and then suddenly by the early 50s millions okay uh tv couldn't kill the movies though the movies just got wider for a while that was that was the hollywood response we need to make the movie going experience bigger grander wider we need to compete with the television and you know it it worked i mean they, they basically they got the audience back thanks to cinemascope <coughs> this division and then movies got a little deeper as well as wider for a few years there, thanks to 3D, which of course we have now. Um, you know, were movies better in 3D? Are they now? Mm, some are. A lot of them are not worth the upcharge. You know, it's just a fad. The one we have now, I think, is just a longer-lasting fad than the one in the 50s. People think about 3D in the 50s, and they think, oh, the whole decade was about two and a half, three years, maybe four. And then it was already off and, you know, out. Um, and I suppose you could call the ongoing decades more to come streak of things like, you know, the Marvel and DC superhero movies a fad too. Some are better than others, uh, like every franchise. But is anybody here with me on the, they might be slightly weary of the fact that we're going to be dealing with the Marvel Universe until you all die. Okay. <laughs> one. One. Okay. That's why they're doing so well, sir. Just told me you. you. All right, too, good. Uh, you know, as a critic, you review an X-Men or a Wolverine movie, and it's kind of like reviewing the opening of a new Red Lobster. <laughs> <laughs> They're very similar to the previous Red Lobster that opened one mall over and to the left, okay? Um, some are better than others, and there are franchises that I, I genuinely kind of think, okay, they're actually finding new directors, new ways to kind of you know, work with the, within this universe. Is it, is it my first choice as a civilian on a Friday night? Maybe not, but as a critic, I sort of appreciate how, you know, if certain, certain movies do kind of, okay, rise to the occasion. But in general, I think these Marvel movies are like gangsters. They show up, and since you've seen the previous two or three movies in that franchise, they want your money, and they're gonna get it one way, they're gonna shake you down for it, usually by advertising. I'd say from the cotton gin to the iPhone, every new technological revolution has messed things up in some human way. The movies dominated our popular culture until TV took over, and now it's you know sort of an uneasy truce between the two, and uh, it's our now, I'd say it's our lives online, which are infinitely broad, but potentially radically much more isolated and isolating, and Yes, there are the occasional miracles of connection. Almost everyone I know, starting with me, has undergone, I'd say, a radical change in their viewing habits, just, just in a short amount of time. 
Five years ago, it would have seemed to me absurd to watch video or an episode of a TV show or an entire feature film on a screen this big. I sometimes do it now for research, but I, I, I was a total snob about seeing it big. But, you know, life does, you know, time is tough. And so, you know, I, I take my time and my screens where I can find them. Um, it's, now it's more of a question of like, can we rate, wait, can we actually wait for the red light to see the funny part of the Melissa McCarthy show and Spicer routine on Saturday Night Live, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm turning into a bad driver because I'm taking, you know, I have one ear for kind of what's, you know, on, on the video. That's not safe, but um, the smaller they get though, here's the paradox. Business at the IMAX theaters actually is pretty strong. Who goes to the IMAX theater? Like, oh, I want to see, I see, there we go, good. I think it's because of a simple truth. When you have a large, looming screen and action, to fall into in a movie that's just that's more than just a format, that's actually a movie that works, the experience becomes something bigger than yourself. And I don't care how big the TVs get at home, it's not the same. It's, you know, you're together alone. That's, that's what movie going has always been. But it's, it's the good kind of together alone, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're alone in the dark. It's you and the movie, and you're surrounded by it. And sometimes you're fighting the experience other people are having. Why am I not laughing like these other people are? Why am I the only, why am I the only one laughing alone? We've, we've had, we may have had these experiences, right? But, you know, it's, there's, something, there's something in the fact that the IMAX format is actually good business right now. Okay, a few memories from my own big screen movie going, childhood division. 1966, I'm in kindergarten, and I'm really into my matchboxes, Hot Wheels and Cola, for like two more years. There's a movie called Grand Prix starring James Garner. It's this three-hour soap opera about Formula One drivers and their neglected, shrewish, and decorative lady friends. I sit there in the front row of the now-defunct Venetian Theater in downtown Racine, Wisconsin, absorbing all these gender stereotypes, you know, like a genius. And uh, director John Frankenheimer's racetrack footage is done in split screen. You know this from the 60s where they got, they fell in love with split screen all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. And uh, they never, they, would, they didn't ever know when to quit, you know. But you know, I'm, I'm five, six years old. Yes, this is why I'm, this is why I was born, you know. And uh, Frankenheimer straps the camera to the to the front bumper of these cars, and I've never seen anything like this. Uh, and I'm watching this thing, and for all I know, I'm probably playing with my matchboxes during the love scenes. But man, these scenes, the racing scenes, fantastic. And I'm sitting so close to the screen that I get this bizarre bloodshot eye condition and I have to stay home from school for the rest of the week. <laughs> and I think there is nothing wrong with the movies. I love that film, my eye hurts, but I get to stay home from school for a week. So I was, <laughs> that's it, I was sold. Now, 1969, that's the year. 69, three years later, was the year I saw Disney's The Love Bug, the first one, four times, okay? That spring. <laughs> My mom takes me to Milwaukee from Racine to see a movie called 2001 A Space Odyssey. Who has seen it? Excellent clicks. Um, my mom was and is seriously one of the kindest. I wish I had her here just to bring it right now. And folks, my mother, Jean Gallagher, uh, one of the kindest, most good natured people on the planet. But on the drive home from that movie, I had a lot of questions, many questions. I was seven, eight years old. What was that metal slab? Uh, what happened at the end? And why was I born? And is that big space baby gonna kill us all? Or what, what's going on? I was, I was actually pretty concerned about this film. Uh, coming off the love bug, that's a tough <laughs> double bill. <laughs> and my mom actually, uh, after about 20 minutes, just pulled the car over right there on the freeway, just pulled over. And she said, you know, I, I, uh, I don't have a single answer for you. And, uh, and then we started up again. And that movie really shook me up, but I, I, even more momentous was the fact that Stanley Kubrick had somehow stunned my ordinarily bubbly mother into a mute state. And it was like being driven home by Buster Keaton or Harpo Marx. It was just, I mean, it really, that movie really put the whammy on me. And to think of that film, G-rated film, a huge success put out by a major studio, it is the most radical, seriously whack, you know, non-narratively kind of conventional big hit that the 60s ever put out, you know, amazing. And almost unthinkable today, right? Hard to imagine. Okay, now this is a small screen memory. 
1971. I'm in my TV room at home in Racine, the one room with the air conditioner in it, watching WGN out of Chicago. Racine's roughly halfway between Chicago and Milwaukee, and we get a lot of old broadcast movies, you know, movies broadcast for free. And this is the days before cable, before VCRs, before dinosaurs ruled the earth, right? On comes this movie called Horse Feathers, a Marx Brothers movie from 1932. Who knows the Marx Brothers? Okay. Some do, some don't. It's, you know, this is ancient history. You know? And for me, comedy was kind of the way into almost everything else with movies, I think. Um, didn't like westerns much, didn't find any westerns I really loved personally until I was almost 40. And maybe that's, I think we all have some genres that we just simply don't get, or we haven't found the ones yet, you know what I mean? And that, for me, it was westerns that took a long time, a long time. Um, so there's horse feathers. Groucho's the college president, Chico's the speakeasy bum, Harpo's the local <laughs> dog catcher, right? I fall in love with these guys, and it, the comedy's totally slapdash and sloppy. It's so funny. The songs are so damn good. The great Calamar Ruby song, whatever it is, I'm against it. And there's no truer anthem for a sullen 10-year-old boy to fall in love with than that song, okay? <laughs> A few weeks later, on comes another Marx Brothers movie. WGN, I go, oh great, I'm gonna watch this. I like this. One from, you know, this, this is one called The Big Store from uh, eight years later, near the end of their career, and it's not funny. And it's, I'm like, I'm having this sort of mini stroke, right? Like, <laughs> why? What, what's going on? These, I love these guys. Why am I not laughing this time? Same, same people. Well, what was it about that other film that was funnier than this one? And that was my seminal aha moment as a critic, okay, I think. <laughs> it got me thinking a little bit in my little 10-year-old pea brain, right, that there must be something more to the movies than the people on the screen. There's other things going on, right? There's a camera and how that camera is framing the action and what the writer has actually given the actors to say, and the music on the soundtrack, all these things have an effect on the experience. And this is what your teachers have been, you know, you've been learning this on your own, you know, in various ways, right? Technique, technique. Yeah, it's not like I knew what an editor did for a living at that age, or how an editor working with the director can build the rhythm of a scene, but I experienced something, and, and I started maybe thinking about, okay, what, what is it about the way this thing is made? So, now, I'm going to show you a couple of scenes. The first is from the third Jason Bourne movie, which was the second one directed by Paul Greengrass. He's the director uh, was it United 93 and uh, further back uh, Bloody Sunday, which you should see from Ireland. Uh, who's, anybody seen that here, Bloody Sunday? Yeah, where it comes out of documentary filmmaking and he's adapted, you can like it or not, but he's adapted his style of, of documentary technique for you know feature filmmaking and you see it in Captain Phillips <coughs> among other things. Uh, and a lot of people experience, I, I, I never get more mail uh, on a review uh, at the Tribune from um, our older subscribers than a Paul Greengrass movie because it is so really aggressively handheld, shaky cam, <laughs> nausea inducing. I mean, I hear from people who say, I, I irked. <laughs> U R P E D, irked. <laughs> Meaning I threw up. I could not, I actually can't physically take his movies, but you know, so be it. Um, uh, so this is, this is from the Board of Ultimatum. Now, plot? Born ultimatum, what do you want to know? He's an assassin, other assassins are trying to kill him, he's running. We're done talking about the plot now. The best Born movies, I think, are all practically abstract in terms of narrative, you know. But in the good Born movies, not so much the last one, but uh, the good ones, you get a few things out of the franchise that most other action franchises, I would argue, who's seen a couple of Born movies? Yeah, all right, good. Uh, you get something out of this franchise that most other action franchises don't bother with. I think mainly it's kind of a sense of moral ambiguity about things like American might and right. You know, it's a little, a little bit gray, and the killing in these movies, the good ones again, actually hurts and matters a little bit anyway, and it costs the perpetrator a little something, which is a very different vibe than we get off most action movies. Okay, so Born Ultimatum, Matt Damon, white man running. Joey Ansa, brown skin adversary, is after him. That's all you got to know. Julia Stiles plays Bourne's shadowy colleague. We're in Tangier, and here is the scene uh, which many of you probably know already. Um, 
from the moment Matt Damon makes the jump across the alley, right, to the moment where the assailant expires on the shower floor, it's 109 seconds of screen time, not quite two minutes. It's 122 separate shots. So that's a shot every second and then some, right? Um, and it's a miracle to me that um, that, that, there, that that film isn't totally, that scene isn't totally visually incoherent. Now, is it too fast for somebody, is it too much, too fast for somebody in this room? We're going to uh, 106 if you can. Um, we can just cut the sound for now. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is not an uncommon editing rhythm or speed these days, right? Uh, Michael Bay actually cuts almost as aggressively and, and sort of frantically in the Transformers movies. Uh, the problem there is that the movies are just about appliances beating up each other. It's like a blender watching a toaster. You know, bam, boom. And, and that's, to me, that's the Transformers movies. They're not just a blender versus toaster from space, okay? Uh, uh, so, actually, that line, I think, comes from Roger Ebert. Uh, and now you can recycle it, too. I just keep using his stuff over and over. But, um, now we're going to take a look at a movie I first saw, probably on TV, around the age of 12 or 13. Alfred Hitchcock was the first director I think I knew by name, and I think I was probably not alone there, my generation especially. Uh, he, he, he was a, direct, a star name like we think of a movie star. Um, a, a brand, I guess you'd call it. Uh, I was watching an amazing PBS series called uh, uh, The Men Who Made the Movies. This is back in the early 70s. Men, yes, no women, God knows. Um, and I'd seen Psycho already, probably at too young an age, uh, in high school. At some point, I remember dragging my brother out to the local University of Wisconsin um, campus, uh, UW Parkside, and threading up a 16 millimeter print to, they had a Psycho. And I was really obsessed with this shower murder, because I'd seen the documentary on Hitchcock. And I remember re-watching the shower murder scene over and over, kind of making my brother watch it. And pointing out, look, 78 cuts, it's amazing, you know, in this short amount of time, my brother is just sort of staring at me like I'm, not like I'm a psychopath, but maybe like a sociopath, right, and uh, potentially. And I think that day is really why my brother today is a pediatric neurologist, you know, so, uh, so North and Northwest. You may know this scene, too, 1959, Cary Grant, a Madison Avenue ad agency executive, has been mistaken for a spy name of George Kaplan. He's been told to meet the real George Kaplan on a two-lane highway in the middle of nowhere, Indiana, a couple hours outside Chicago. Now, take your time with this scene, okay, because the scene certainly does. So hang on. I love this establishing shot. How how did they get the camera up what to get that shot? You know? Okay. Uh, who has seen who saw that for the first time just now? Oh. First time just now. Okay, good. Um, this is, I want to hear more when we do a little uh, back and forth uh, conversation at the end of this. I want to hear more about just how it felt to you, but uh, that scene arrives an hour and six minutes into Hitchcock's film, which is exactly when the Tangier Smackdown we saw before that shows up in the Bourne Ultimatum. Now, these are obviously polar opposite sequences in approach and technique and rhythm, right? I mean, uh, that's the most obvious of the editing rhythm. This is not familiar cinematic language for a lot of younger audiences today, and even to a lot of adults. It just isn't. Um, well, you know, uh, did you did you go through a kind of a period of like two minutes in of like what the hell am I? Let's go, you know, and then maybe you settle in around minute three, minute four, and then maybe by a minute uh, once once we get that mysterious sort of like the planes, Dustin Crops or Rain or Crops, and it's like five minutes. Then but then then you're really kind of in a you know you realize you're sort of in this waking daytime nightmare sequence you know it's it's uh it's it's like that i think you settle in and the, and the way that rhythm is, is slowly sort of setting the trap for you it's like ensuring your entrapment right i happen to like the way paul greengrass shoots and edits action in that born ultimatum sequence i like it um and he's about the only one out there who can cut that 
crazy fast and not make me, not get me lost. Do you know what I mean? Often action sequences today are just simply a matter of like, what's actually happening? You know? It's fast, it's sort of exciting, it's, but it's kind of visually, it's just, it's, it's, it's not quite, quite that. I think you, you can actually see what's happening moment to moment, and micro moment to micro moment in that Bornholm main sequence. You can argue with me, but that's what I think. Um, now, what's the one thing those two scenes have in common? A couple things. Most of the action, no music. Who needs it? You know, Bernard Herrmann waiting desperately to kind of come in. You know, but he, you know, he waited ten minutes. Right? <coughs> Did he have the same number of cuts? No, no, no. Far fewer. Far fewer. Far fewer. Yeah. In Hitchcock, you mean? Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Far fewer. Yeah. Um, uh, but I would say the thing they have in common, especially, is that they don't give the, those these movies really don't give a damn about whether or not the plot makes sense. Okay. Uh, they really don't. The plot of the Born Ultimatum, as I said, is two words. He runs. Okay. The plot of North by Northwest is he runs. That's it. Originally, Hitchcock and the screenwriter, Ernest Lehman, had an expository setup to this scene where James Mason, the bad guy, was setting up the killing of the Cary Grant character in a conversation with one of his henchmen. Okay. The dialogue is along the lines of, hey, uh, didn't you fly Nazi fighter planes in the war? Why, yes, I did boss, and uh, I know where I can get a crop duster, and, uh, you know, da, 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 da. and then they realized in the editing, who needs it? Let, let's just make it completely mysterious and cryptic. <laughs> you know, what? What's this plane? Why? Who's killing? Who's trying to kill me? You never find out. You don't even really know it's the Mason's henchman, I don't think. But the scene is more bizarre and effective the way they it turned out, I think. So I'm not saying words don't matter, but sometimes they matter less than images, okay? Joan Didion, the writer, said it. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. And I think we go to the movies to see ourselves, and we go to the movies to see people not like ourselves. We go to experience a slice of life, or as Hitchcock used to say, a slice of cake. Okay, escapism. I want to get away from my from the real world, from my troubles. You know, common, common impulse for a century. Okay. But if audiences are really only into, say, the Fast and Furious movies or whatever, or in, the, in its day, North the Northwest, why did so many of this year's Best Picture Academy Award nominees make so much money back on their original investments? It's, it's, of course, I don't really care about money much with the movie business. It's not really the most interesting thing to me. But I take some heart from the fact that Moonlight costs somewhere between 1.3 and $1.5 million to make, and it's made 15 times that. Nice. Manchester by the Sea, solid financial success, and nobody would have predicted that, given how, uh, you know, how grief-stricken that character is, and how little uh, conventional redemption or uh, happy ending they're willing to go with in that film. I think that movie offers the only degree of happy ending that would still make it honest. I think. Uh, La La Land cost $30 million. It took years to get that thing off the ground. Uh, it's grossed more than 10 times that worldwide. And none of those movies uh, were a sure thing. You know, there was just no such thing as a sure thing anyway. We're living at a time in the film industry, I think, and, um, you know, in the body politic, where it's crucial that we hold ourselves and the powers that be accountable to what's possible and necessary, okay? And I think on a national political level right now, we're being told by certain actions and policies to go back to the way things, the way things were before all this sort of lousy inclusion and all this generosity of spirit. It's never been more important, I think, for all of us to keep an eye on the images emanating from all our screens and what they're really telling us, okay? And as a critic, I try, don't always succeed, I try to have one eye on the real world and one eye on the ideal world, which is the place where we should go next as writers, filmmakers, students, digital consumers, as people. The film industry, I don't think, can even pretend to know what it's doing anymore. It's a thousand separate flailing business models struggling to figure out the new platforms and the lessons are already years late in learning from television. 
there's a reason the movies are, you know, again, sort of all slight, the box office is going down. The television is really good now. I'm about the 40 millionth person to say it. And there's just less concern about, oh, we got to make the protagonist relatable and likable. and re You know, they, they're just more interested in being interesting and, 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 and kind of just putting the, putting the burden back on the writers. And, that, and that's where you see, you know, a, a, full, a, full, a fuller image of American society on television, more so than the movies. We're catching up, catching up. Um, I think what we can do as critics and audiences is respond to what matters to us without fear of an unpopular opinion. One eye in the real world, the other on the ideal world. And that's where the true artists come in. In 2001, A Space Odyssey, Dr. Haywood Floyd reveals that the mysterious slab, the obelisk, right, found on the moon, was too much for the public to bear. It needed a cover story, he says, to mitigate, quote, the potential for cultural shock and social disorientation. Now, before we get to the, uh, just a question or two, I, and I hope you have a couple. Uh, I'd like to hear from you on these subjects, but um, I want to say this in conclusion. I really, oh, you just cut that. Hitchcock should probably have the last word. <laughs> uh, I'd say this, just in conclusion. I really, really hope the cinema never forgets its potential for cultural shock and social disorientation. It's never been more important for all of us to open our hearts and our eyes, sharpen our wits, and you know, try to try to seek out what the filmmakers are trying to tell us. And I don't think it will ever be too late for the next vital and surprising filmmaker to assert herself or himself with a camera and a point of view and say to us as moviegoers, this is how I see the world. Now, how do you see what I see? Thank you. People, first time, North by Northwest. That's like a mini. That's like a short film on, into, uh, you know, on its own. You don't need to know. As I say, the plot means nothing. <laughs> uh, you don't need to. Know. How did? How did it play for you? I mean, that is it just. It just tell me. Give me. Give me some. Give me some feedback. It was boring. Boring. Yeah. Just too like what is going on, right? It's yeah. We ha have you seen anything like that in you know in the last few years? No. It's ancient, it's an ancient film language. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually found it pretty intriguing, but I uh, am interested in older movies, and I uh, watch older movies that have that uh, much slower... Slower rhythm. Yeah, and so I find that uh, unique compared yeah. to what is constantly happening nowadays with that very fast rhythm. And right. so to have it drawn out in such a way is unique. Right. What? It does something to you, though. It forces you, you know, to kind of like what, well, you know, it, it's trapping you, <laughs> right? And it's a different kind of, it's a different experience, you know, like it or not. And you can like it or not like it. It's, it's like a, um, yeah, go ahead. So, coming into this class as a whole, I have not watched many movies, but Hitchcock is a name that whether or not you have watched a ton of movies you hear a lot about. Right. So I'm thinking as I'm going into this, or as, this, as the suspense is kind of playing out for the first few minutes, you know, what's going to happen to this guy? Is Hitchcock going to kill him off? Because right. he likes to do that, I think. I don't know. <laughs> but the uncertainty coupled with um, what I think his reputation is as a filmmaker and what is actually happening on the screen being very mysterious right. made the scene incredibly interesting. All right, good. Yeah. Now, you should know, uh, and this is the great thing about Hitchcock, and I didn't know this until I'd seen a, a, a few of them, he's really a, a, a... You cannot type his movies. The film he made right after this, one year later, Psycho is... Uh, I mean, for the time, was a, I hate to say this in front of a camera, a balls out horror movie that was like more violent and grislier and a completely different tone than this. I mean, and it was a huge hit. And it started, it was a real, it changed things. But it, I mean, that, it was shot in this, you know, I mean, it, it was a disreputable, kind of grimy, really violent, and, you know, there's one plot incident that is, yes, a surprising. Killing off of a major character. Okay, so that's the great thing about discovering a director that you do like for whatever reason. You go back in and you realize, okay, they're not all. Maybe there's some common ideas or themes, but they have very different stuff. 
and that's that's great when the director has the latitude. Yes. Um, I think it reminded me a lot of like a modern horror film um, because it kind of left you in suspense, especially towards the beginning. Um, I think one thing that we've learned in class a lot is to look for everything on the screen. Um, but like a modern viewer wouldn't really notice the plane in the background, um, and they'd be like, "Well, why is this guy just standing on the road?" waiting for something to happen right and then once the plane does like <coughs> once the guy mentions the plane yeah oh yeah there was a plane plan, but. there's one thing that, that, that I always I, uh, I always think twice about when I show this because it, there's really no other scene like this in the movie the movie the movie skips along pretty good and packs a, a, a lot of incident none of it plausible all of it, most of it entertaining, you know, uh, into, it's 119 minutes or whatever it is. So this, this is really like this weird respite, you know, this weird pause before before things get rough for Cary Grant in this, you know, uh, so it's, it's an unusual, it's an unusual moment. Yes? I'd say the pacing um, leaves me with my own thoughts a, a lot more than other films, a lot of films move quick enough. Yeah, I saw you text him, so yeah, you don't have to pretend. <laughs> I, I wasn't, don't worry, but yeah, just... It, it went slow enough that it made you uh, think more about like um, when the cars pass. It's like, is this going to be that car? Is it? Yeah. It, it went slow enough that you you it left you a lot with your thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. David Fincher does a kind of variation of that in movies like Zodiac a little bit, a little bit. He learned a little bit from Hitchcock. Maybe more he should. Yeah. Um, well, I actually noticed the plane, and this is my first time saying it. Like, oh, the, the guy's in the plane, he's going to stop and get out of the plane and talk to him. And then when it didn't happen, I was like, oh, right. okay, no, oh, wait, where's the guy? Is yeah. he coming? Oh, it's the guy's in, he's right across the street. Right, right, right. No, okay. Yeah. And then the plane started going after him, like, oh, this is kind of cool, but... Uh, that what? <laughs> you now you watch you watch this scene, and, and you can, and again, you can like it or not, or it can be effective for you, or just really make you itchy, you know, restless. That's totally all valid. It's 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 probably instructive just to at least look and talk about what what in it dates and what does not date. The one thing that to me dates, of course, is a, a mismatch in terms of the location work, where you, you have people really out there in a real location. It's not Indiana. They actually went to. Uh, either Modesto or Central California, they grew some corn <laughs> nine months earlier and then filmed it. You know, and it was flat enough to look like the Midwest, okay? So there's those scenes, and then there's scenes where it's Cary Grant in a studio, rear projection, <clears throat> you know, that stuff. And the one shot that is unfortunately dated to our eyes, I mean, truly, is, is with the truck, right? You know, that, that cutting in that moment is not quite what it should be. And I'm not sure if it looked any less corny in 59, I can't say. It was two years before I was born. So. Uh, but you know, do you know what I mean? I mean like the, rest of the rest of that scene kind of holds, I think, now. It just is what it is. And you can, again, like it or not. But, uh, um, but talk to me a little bit, folks, about um, if you feel like movie going is sort of a, a, a seriously kind of optional thing for you in terms of going out to the movies. Yes. It is. Just and the reasons would be what? Why? Why go out, right? Uh, because usually, I mean, I use Apple TV more than anything else. Right. Right. I mean, there's Netflix. There's more options now. More options. Yeah. Who else? Yeah. If I go on a date with someone. I'll, the first thing I say is like, hey, you want to go, go to the movies? Where we go? That's, I think that's part of the movie going experience is going there with someone instead of just like, let's stay home and watch Netflix or something like that. So if you get a flat no, then you know it's not going to work out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah, that's quick. You can move that. That's, that's like speed dating. That's yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, for me, it's different because if I really like a movie and I see the trailer, I wanted to see it for the first time. So you see a tra you see the trailer and you think, oh, good, maybe. No, I'm sorry. No, no, I see what you mean, but but yeah. I'm, just, I'm just repeating just so people can hear it. That's all. Yeah. Uh, so I I feel like it's important for the to see the film in the theater for the first time because it's something that is different from just seeing it on your phone at your home. Like the the environment of it builds you more into it. It makes you more invested into right. the movie. Especially seeing for the first time. Right. I think we feel a little burned when we make the commitment, right, to go out and, you know, you know, cost a certain amount of money. God knows the snacks are not reasonably priced, but whatever. And then the movie just turns out to be 
for me, the fatal thing is not the is not the disaster, a movie that's terrible. It's the movie that's, eh, you know. And this is the, this is the fact of life. As different as we all are in this room, I suspect we all have the same percentages. What do I mean by that? You get, let's say you go to two movies a week. This is, only applies to some of us, but two movies a week, 100 movies a year. Let's say 20 of those, really good, glad, well worth the 14, whatever. What do they charge full price here on a Friday night? 12, 50, 12, whatever. Well worth it, well worth it. Uh, 20 or 30 out of the 100, really not worth, even after two beers on the couch, nothing, not worth it. You know, just, uh, yeah. That leaves about 45, 55 out of the 100 that are kind of, uh, how often do we come out of a movie, wherever we watch it, and say, it was okay. Okay, that's, that's the majority of your movies in, all year, somewhere in between inspiration and disaster, <laughs> right? That seems like a fair assessment, correct? Um, uh, I will say this is, this is the part where I seek your pity in what I do for a living. Those are mixed, re those reviews, the okays, are what I have to do 55% of my life, and they are not easy. Because it's a lot easier to react like, oh my god, it was great, you know, and then you can, you can get to the reasons why something is good or really, you know, kind of gotcha uh, more, more quickly. It's just like if it's a disaster, you have, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's like it's giving you the information, like, you know, but it's that middle ground that's very hard to write, and that's why mixed reviews are so frustrating to read, you know, because it's like, you know, you want to be told, terrible, don't go. Terrific, don't miss it. And then you don't want to 55% of the time you hear something else. Yeah? What's your three favorite movies? Ever? Ever. I resent that question. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I, my list tends to change a lot, you know, depending on where I am in my life, I guess. But, um, uh, what genre do you have, you know, a type of? Uh, good. My genre is good. <laughs> uh, I, I really do like all kinds. Uh, like I say, I was slow to come to s some of them, westerns, you know, particularly. And, and then, again, this is not a this is not a vital genre today, you know. Anyway, but but I thought that was uh, was it was cur it was instructive to me to realize how long it took me to find the ones that I liked, and then you start figuring out, okay, what, you know, and they they tend not to be the famous ones. They tend to be. Uh, uh, director Anthony Mann, the movie like um, uh, Naked Spur, stuff from the early 50s. Uh, the early 310 to Yuma, and somebody might have seen the remake here, right? Russell Crowe, Chris Bay, yeah, which is pretty good, but the old one's terrific. And, and uh, you know, I am kind of, a, kind of a sucker for a good musical. Uh, uh, so Singing in the Rain tends to, tends to land on that list, you know, the, the movies I go back to. I really love His Girl Friday with Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell. Um, war movies. Uh, huh. well, I love Paths of Glory, the Kubrick's Paths of Glory. That's a great World War One film. It gets a hell of a lot done in about 85 minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just something that comes to mind. How about ones with the Nicholas Brothers? Mm -hmm. The Nicholas Brothers, the yeah, dancers. Uh, great. Yeah, the, especially the 43 film with the Yeah, no, they're great. Jeff Calloway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so they're great. Uh, what about you? What are your three favorites? No, I'm looking at you. Oh, me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like the Searchers. Okay. Uh, yeah? Did you read that book on the Searchers that came out a couple years ago? No, I didn't. Yeah, check it out. I I just, same guy Same guy just wrote a, a pretty good book about the making of High Noon, uh, a film that I, again, didn't have a personal relationship with. Gary Cooper is the sheriff, you know, has to, has to deal alone because the town folk won't help him. Uh, he can't get a posse up to kind of fight the guys who are coming back to town to kill him. Um, and it was made during the height of the Red Scare in Hollywood, and, and the screenwriter and producer got blacklisted, and uh, you know Cooper almost bailed. And it was—it's an interesting book. And Quiet Man was a good movie. Too. Quiet Man, John Wayne. You just are all about the John Wayne, man. Not <laughs> all. Yeah, yeah. Those are yeah. Those are and John Ford, your director, obviously. Good. What else? We'll be going have a say. Yes. I'm, I'm curious as you guys are talking and. <laughs> I'm looking at all of them. I'm wondering how much the movie experience now is about control. Yes. Like relinquishing control and knowing that you're going to have that hour and a half, two hour break in the theater where you have an excuse to not have to check your phone, right. pause here, go there, be distracted by that. Whereas when it's Apple TV at home, you still have control. 
we have a lot of things to do. I can hit pause, I can do this, I can be multitasking and have one eye up. Right. So I'm wondering if that push-pull is also leading some people to not go to the theater because they want to be able to do it on their terms, hit pause, rewind it. Yeah, I just don't think, some are going. I think that's a good point. I think a lot of people just don't see the advantages, you know, they don't see economically or otherwise, you know. Um, uh, it's, and I, and I, I, I was a complete hardliner about it until a few years ago, and now my life is sort of this weird mixture of both. You know, because I'm watching movies at some pretty strange hours. You got three kids. You know, you, you you take your time at home when you can, and I tend to work early in the morning. I like I like to knock one off before the day starts, if it's if, especially if it's for research, not for review. I mean, that's the thing about the job is that you know there's the stuff you write about, and then there's the stuff underneath that you know that you needed to do for research because you don't want to be the dummy uh, who we'll talk about this in the writing classes tomorrow, but. Um, if, if you're, who's done any kind of like write, uh, critical writing on anything, any kind of review, great, this is perfect. So, how often do you have that thing, how, how do I start this thing? I, I have no idea. I, well, how, you know, and usually it means it's, it's your subconscious saying, you don't know enough yet. And the good thing about that is that you, there are ways to make, to make that go away, which is take the time, just do the, at least knock off a little r related viewing, like, oh, this so-and-so filmmaker has only made two previous films. Maybe I should actually take the three hours and 42 minutes to see both of those, whether or not I write about them or not. But like when I find I'm sort of frozen and a little panicky at the keyboard, it's because I, I don't think I'm smart enough yet. It never goes away. But, but it'll go away if you do some research. And then whether or not even, you don't even have to use what you just learned. It just makes you, it calms you down. Because then you feel like, okay, I got it, <laughs> you know. Anyway, that's a, that's a uh, Yes? There's three factors for me to go see a movie. Three factors to see yeah. a movie. One, if... I'm going to act them up, go ahead. Yeah, well, <laughs> one, if I know that there will be kids there and parents talking to their kids okay. or people on the phone. Right. Because I've been to places where people are leaning into me. I haven't had good experiences. So I've been stopping to go see movies. Right. Um, another one is if I know I'm going to be spoiled of the movies for my friends. So any of like, I, I, I was really a big fan of this last Star Wars movie, Rogue Run. Uh -huh. I just wanted to see it before anybody else could tell me what happened. Right. Um, and then another is financial. Since I'm a student and I'm trying to save as much money before I go into debt, uh, $15 a movie isn't really helpful. Totally, totally. So. No, and I, look, I mean, I know too many people who, yes. you know, have, you know, assume that they're fine if they just rip it off on Pirate Bay or you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I actually, I agree with um, what Ms. Harvey was saying. Um, I think control is control. more important. Uh, for me, I think you do have a role that has. Yep. Uh, if you get up, you need to use the restroom, you're going to be something, you know, that can be important. You can't really, like, you have to sit still and just get the floor. Right. Totally. Yeah. No, and I like I like all that. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I I look forward to my next bigger, much bigger TV. You know, I yeah, no, I agree. I think uh, watching movies on the projector is a good experience, but uh, I feel like control how it makes it. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. For me, it's. Um, Kind of a control thing, but in the opposite respect of, I'm the I'm that weird millennial that hates have like, being so attached to technology. Right. And it's for me, it's I get to shut off from technology for a while, in a sense. You like that? Yeah. We're gonna find out eventually when when all when this entire room and the generation and all of us in whatever age we are were studied in about 50 years and like holy moly no wonder they were getting in so many car accidents uh, uh, yeah you know I mean just generally adults what is it doing to what is it doing to our wiring you know yeah uh, who haven't we heard from you yes uh, well kind of similar along that path I have always grown up loving going to the movies that's sort of just I only recently started getting into the TV aspect and see that was typically the only way I would really get to see a movie or maybe we rented it we missed it uh -huh. but seeing it and then also getting a chance to see some classic movies in the theaters I started to notice the reason why 
going to the theater, at least for me, is so appealing is because you have an audience, and there are some times when you see a movie uh, at home and something isn't funny or you right. know, it doesn't read, but then all of a sudden you're an audience and everybody's cracking up. And it's not just comedies, too. I mean, I mean, co the experience of seeing a comedy with a crowd is is like the, the difference between that and alone, uh, uh, you know, on the, on, uh, on the couch or just two or three. A huge difference, but it's not just that, too. It's it's amazing to see a movie where just even just the suspense, well, especially uh, who's seen Carrie from 1976? Holy moly. So there I am, 15 years old. Yeah, waiting for the 9.30 with my friends, and uh, uh, we hear, we're on the sidewalk, waiting to get into the 9.30, and uh, we hear this inside the theater, and I'm in a scream like I've never heard, and then the doors, boom, go up, and ah, talk to them. we're like, holy moly, what are we in for here? Well, movie starts, we luckily forget that, we forget that something is coming. And then the ending, I'm going to totally spoil this for you people. That was the first time, I think the first time, that there had been a switcheroo false ending, right? Where you have this sort of dream sequence where laying flowers at the grave, the flute, this sweet flute is playing on the soundtrack. And then the bloody hand comes up from the grave, <laughs> grabs her, right? And it was the first time anybody tried an ending like that, I think. And well, there we were screaming, you know, <laughs> urinating, I think some of us. And, uh, I mean, it was a really great, you know, it's, uh, and that, that would not be the same alone. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just, um, uh, I remember uh, seeing Buster Keaton uh, in, I think, Our Hospitality at the, uh, when I was in college at the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, and they were showing some of the old silent comedies, and there's, a, there's one stunt he does where he swings on a rope and rescues somebody off uh, out of a canoe that's about to go down over the waterfall. I'm kind of misremembering the details, but it is like a stunning one-take stunt. And that crowd, I, and I've never heard a crowd like this before since, just, you know, and it worked like a charm. And there was live piano, you know, Butch Thompson from the Garrison Keillor show was, you know, pounding away in the corner. And it was a huge, huge screen at the museum. And I'll tell you, man, that was worth the 850. You know, <laughs> it just was. Yeah. Um, and to go on that, I think that there's, there's still a level of uh, romanticism going to the movie. Uh -huh. And that it shouldn't be negated. Watch the artist just because I loved the experience of being in the theater and hearing the gas, the and all that, and I and I haven't watched it since, and I don't think it would be good. The same, yeah, yeah, it won't be communal. It won't be communal. Now the problem with the romanticism about it is that it's completely negated by what you're saying here, which is like, you know, the. You know the the, the 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 milling, the hubbub, the texting, the parents, the children, the you know uh, it's it's not. There's a lot that works against yeah, your experience. Do we? We're way over time. I think here, maybe it's time for one, one more, more question. Uh, no, I was going to say to the we have to the, the same thing. There's something about the immersiveness of a theater, and just for a personal anecdote, I learned the hard way that there are certain films you need to see. That I always regret not seeing Braveheart in a theater. Big theater, yeah. And, a massive screen because they just they just work better that way. And and today I still will go to the movies, but they're very much movies that I put like action, like Marvel movies, Star Trek movies, anything that is big and epic. I want to see like that. Right. Or something that I feel is not traditional. If I'm Hollywood, I want to go out and get my own so that those films will can can be seen as marketable so that people make more films that are not so mainstream or not so traditional Hollywood and right. get other stories out there. Right. That's a great place to end that, I think. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you.